Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. Today, my guest is Josh Hendricks, and Josh is doing some very interesting things when it comes to hemp in our legislation. He is working with Senator McConnell to help, let's say, get hemp legalized or pulled off the Schedule 1. How are you doing today, Josh? I'm good. Just happy to be on the show. So let me ask you, how did this come about? How did how did your involvement come to being with Senator McConnell and the hip, hemp legislation bill? Uh, yeah, I got, I, got, I got involved in hemp. I got interested in hemp back in college in the mid-2000s. And I got, you know, got pulled back to Kentucky. Hemp kind of pulled me back here in 2014 because of the farm bill which Senator McConnell had a hand in as well. It doesn't get enough credit for because uh, there were so many people that helped get the, the hemp language and started the farm bill that allowed states like Kentucky and Colorado, North Carolina, and others to enact state laws that would allow farmers to participate in hemp, hemp farming and processing and trying to create a domestic supply chain for already existing hemp products like hemp foods and hemp fibers and now hemp nutraceuticals with hemp derived hemp extracts. And, uh, you know, I've grown hemp for the past three years. Because of that, I got involved with certain associations. Uh, one of them happened to be the Kentucky Hemp Industry Council, which quickly became the kind of the, the voice behind the legitimate, as I like to say, lobbying uh, for the hemp industry. And that quickly evolved into the U.S. Hemp Roundtable uh, because so many companies from around the country were joining and saying, look, we need serious lobbying, uh, serious efforts on this to continue the progress we made with the Farm Bill in 2014 and get something that really puts the framework around what hemp products are and why they're legal and removes the plant from the Controlled Substance Act so that farmers and processors can make the proper investments to really get this off the ground and get this commoditized. And so through that involvement and the, the, the hemp brown tables, uh, you know, work in D.C. with Congressman Comer, Congressman Massey from Kentucky, uh, Senator Paul, and obviously Senator McConnell from Kentucky, and then you know, Ron Wyden from Oregon and many others. Uh, from other states, it became, you know, part of my job, part of my, part of my role. <laughs> it's part of, kind of part of my life. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, we've been working on it ever since, and he's been a real champion of this, which is, you know, as some of the media might point out, odd uh, that, that someone like that is, is championing him. But that it just goes to show that this is a common sense bill. Um, it's not marijuana. It's not anything along those lines. This is about farmers and jobs and, and a, and a marketplace that's already that already has many hemp products from around the world existing in it already. So why is it federally illegal, and why is it a scheduled one, particularly if it does not contain any substances such as psychoactive properties? Yeah, so uh, you know, a couple of reasons. Going back in the early 1900s, we saw the development of plastic and nylon. And you know, back then they didn't know the, the negative effects that would have on the environment by any means, uh, but they just saw a faster way to create material. And hemp went away because all hemp was really useful was material, but all cannabis went away uh, due to the Marijuana Tax Act. And so, uh, it, you know, the, they didn't have the science we have now to be able to differentiate. Oh, that's a hemp plant. Oh, that's uh, you know somebody needs somebody's rolling that up to smoke it type plant. And it just kind of went by the wayside. So we've had, you know, all cannabis, both marijuana and hemp, have been illegal since 1936. And it, it made a comeback during the war and then went away just because we needed some material. But it was, it's was it been non-existent. Every other country uh, figured out, oh, well, hemp's okay whether we like marijuana or not because it's, it's a great resource for food and for fiber. And never really put a... You know, they learned quickly before we did how to put a connotation on that with the 0.3% THC limits and kind of separated the two. And so because we've never separated the two in America, uh, they've been cast under the same spell, if you will. And they've both been illegal, and both marijuana and hemp have been controlled substances. But in 2004, the HIA won a case against the DEA in the Ninth District Circuit Court that said hemp products 
uh, that contain less than 0.3% THC, such as Dr. Bar soap and the tea and hemp foods and hemp t-shirts and hats and shoes and all the jazz that was going on in the late 90s, early 2000s, was legal. So now you have a situation where hemp products are legal, but the hemp plant itself is illegal, just like marijuana cultivation was illegal in many in every state for a while and still is in many states. So the hemp plant is, is controlled substance, but the hemp products are not now. And we're just trying to get that plant removed so that the money that needs to be invested in the in the you know the infrastructure of the industry can be done so without the worry that this isn't going to be legalized and this is going to be still something that's under the restrictions of you know the heavy restrictions and heavy um, you know fees I guess you would say with 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 the other type of cannabis. So currently in the United States, what is currently produced under hemp? What what products are made with hemp that we currently use or can use? How can it change our future? Yeah, so under the pilot programs, people like myself and many other farmers around the country have licenses to cultivate hemp. Uh, and there's, there's some fiber efforts going on with uh, Sunstrand to make biocomposite materials such as door panels and dashboards and anything that is a uh, you know, sustainable material. Like Henry Ford did. Yeah, very much. If you buy a brand new Mercedes or BMW, there's already hemp and uh, canaf in your in your dashboard. You don't know it, you can't tell, but it's lighter, it's more durable. And over there, they actually have environmental fines if you don't start using some of these materials. So we're you know we're a little bit far behind on that. But hemp fibers can produce great insulation for homes and all kinds of cool stuff on the material side, which is where a lot of the hemp you know, the production will need to go because that's about numbers. That's about adding up mass materials massive amounts of materials and, and doing the work with that. Then you've got the hemp food side, which already exists with the hemp seeds. You can crush those up. You can press the oil out of them. You can use that in cosmetics and body care. You can eat it as a great omega-6 to omega-3 ratio protein. It goes great on salads, things like that. You're going to hopefully start seeing hemp oil, hemp seed oil uh, from the seeds, hopefully replace soy. You know, soy is in so many things as a food filler that we don't realize and it's it's terrible for us. It actually is really bad for our health. It gives us the munchies in a sense. That's a whole other conversation. But um, you know, it makes us you know, the whole bet you can't eat just one potato chip is real. <laughs> that's that's a real problem. Yeah. Um, so if it, if it replace the food source with that. And but what's really driving the train right now, to be honest with you, is the nutraceutical industry, which is hemp extract. So everybody's talking about CBD. Uh, that's the big molecule right now, and it, it can't get too high. It's totally safe, not addictive. But it does have properties that, that definitely are showing a range of effects on people and really just giving people a better quality of life, like many supplements, like fish oil, turmeric, and, and other natural things that people are starting to put into their diet. And so that's, you know, that's really pushing the train right now. But all of these products, the main thing that everyone needs to know is they contain less than 0.3% THC. And that's what gets you high from cannabis. And so to put that in perspective, Marijuana in Colorado right now has 50, 60 percent THC. In it. So you're talking about 0.3. That's no different than that. You know, people may not realize decaf coffee has a little bit of caffeine in it, and um, kombucha has a little bit of alcohol. Sugar free has a little bit of sugar. Uh, it's just trace amounts. So it's a definition of zero. Therefore, non psychoactive, non intoxicating. Uh, it's certainly not addictive. Got you. Now you've been a hemp farmer uh, for some time, I believe. And you also have your company, which is CV Sciences. So, you know, for one thing, there has to be a re-education of the American public to understand the difference between the psychoactive properties of the hemp strain versus those that don't have the psychoactive hemp strains. And you touched a little bit on the CBD content. Um With your company, especially, you know, your interest in the CBD content – and I've seen it come recently to Indiana, which I call the Bible Belt of the North. I was just shocked. <laughs> so how is that oil becoming popular as not only a dietary supplement, but what other attributes does it have? Because I've seen it where it can help uh, kids with seizures down to chronic inflammation. So what's the skinny on that? Yeah, I mean, this, the science out there and listeners out there should always check out pubmed.gov, P-U-B-M-E-D.gov, 
and you can research CBD or cannabidiol, which is what it stands for, uh, and, and anything. And, and there's all kinds of great studies out there. You don't have to read the whole thing. If you're like me, you just flip to the summary. Uh, but, uh, you know, the thing that's doing is, is, is out there. I mean, I can't talk about it because of the shake of plants and all that good stuff. But if the reality is, if we told you the, story, the stories we hear, you know, we, you'd think we were crazy. But the, it, the, the fact is, this product delivers on the promise. And the promise is simple. Everybody wants to feel better, right? Whether you've got one health goal or 10. And I think when people start to realize that, as you start to look at it and say, okay, you know, I buy a cup of coffee every day or Coca Cola or a pack of cigs or whatever it may be for, for you. And is that really improving my quality of life? Is that really helping me, as we like to say, harness my human potential? And I think the answer is usually no uh, in most cases, or, it, or maybe it's only helping 5, 10%. If you could take a supplement every day and it would improve your quality of life 10, 20, 25, 30% for, you know, a handful of dollars a day, the same price, wouldn't you do that? And I, you know, my answer is obviously yes. And the reality of the situation is this is a 50, 60, 70, a hundred percent quality of life improvement for some people. I mean, some people do a 180, uh, in terms of just their, their get up and go, right. Their attitude about life changes. And so, you know, him, him drives CBD and plus CBD oil, our brand, uh, you know, it, it could be used as a band-aid, sure. You know, I always give the example, if you're gluten intolerant, you know, if you, if you start taking plus CBD oil as a supplement, it's probably going to help you, you know, digest gluten better. But if you stop eating gluten because you're gluten intolerant and start taking plus CBD oil, you're probably just going to get on the right track to a healthier lifestyle. So I think that's how people have to look at it. There's, there's a range, there's a product in our category uh, for everybody, whether you're a you know, CrossFitter that works out twice a day, or you've got ten different things that bother you. Been going to the doctor for years, and, and you just can't seem to feel good when you wake up in the morning. There's there's a a, a variety of products out there uh, within our Plus CBD oil line that that can certainly help you get towards that. Yeah, I can concur with you because one of the things that I found out we, we recently were introduced to my wife and I were introduced to CBD oil, and my wife said, "Hey." It's not psychoactive. I'll try it. So she tried and she was having some neck issues that she had been complaining about for a couple of years now. I haven't heard her complain yet. And then she ran out and she's like, I'm going to get my CBD. I'm like, what's so great about it? I was like, I had great energy and I was, I felt balanced, but I was like, what's it doing? And she's like, my neck did not hurt at all. Nowhere near when I was taking the CBD oil. And I was like, hmm, because they did say it helps for inflammation and some of the body elements. Um, right. So you said that your product is plus CBD oil, correct? Yes, plus CBD oil. And where can people find out specific information uh, that will help them pertaining to plus CBD oil? Uh, well, you, you can always go to pluscbdoil.com. And, and learn more about the products, see what we have available, sprays, droppers, soft gels, capsules, bombs, um, you know, how, however you like to, to take your supplements, we've got a version of it for you. And then you're going to look at the different levels. So, you know, the red level, the raw level, going to be our, our, our daily, um, you know, anti-inflammatory, workout-related soreness, things like that. Uh, really just a, an herbal aspirin, if you will. And that's kind of how I take the on the road <laughs> and kind of, as my grandfather would say, all stoked up, and I, don't, I haven't taken an ibuprofen or a leave or anything in eight, nine years now. Uh, that's what I take now. Um, our green product, we're going to you know, up-concentrate that, activate all those cannabinoids, and that's where you're going to start to get CB1 and CB2 receptors, CB, CB2 being that, that, that down kind of stuff, uh, you know, body-related, CB1 being the nervous system, neurological system, those two types of things, those receptors are being affected and balanced out. It use the word balance, which is great. I didn't even have to say it first. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the goal is balance, right? Life is all about balance these days. And so when you feel balanced, especially mentally, all of a sudden you're thinking clear. You're, you know, you're reacting fast. You work, um, you know, your work, I guess, productivity goes up, at least in my case. And for me, it was one of those things where, you know, as I said, I haven't taken a synthetic drug. I haven't even taken a cough drop in eight or nine years. And it's just because I stopped wanting to try. I didn't trust that stuff. And once I found plus CBD oil and hemp extracts in general, it was a way to 
you know, utilize the cannabis plant without having the negative effects of being high and unproductive or, you know, high and paranoid and yeah. you know, many of the things that come <laughs> along with the THC side. So, you know, we, we're just scratching the surface on this, and I think you're going to continue to see the, the, the CBD trend, uh, and because it, it mainly from hemp, because it's going to be widely available, uh, you're going to start seeing it everywhere. So what was your introduction to, how did you come to this? I mean, was it uh, you're farming all your life or you grew up on a farm <laughs> and your family and you probably did some research because historically hemp was one of the most widely used plants for society up until the 1930s, particularly uh, in the 19th and um, early 20th century. You know, boat sails, clothing, some rope. There are so many applications for it. So, how did you right. initially go from zero to a hundred? Well, it's funny you know, because I grew up farming. I, I was quoted in an article a year and a half ago, and uh, it said, you know, if you told my grandfather. Uh, seven years ago that I was going to come back and, and work on the farm in any capacity, he would have laughed at you because farm was punishment <laughs> or fear money for me. Uh, there, was, there was no enjoyment that, went, that came from the farm growing up. So um, it, it, it's funny to everybody that I moved back to do the same thing. But my grandpa is also the reason I'm into this. And he was fairly good friends with a, a local politician and attorney that ran as an independent and was, was really ahead of his time then gave with Galbraith and he wrote a book called The Last Free Man in America and I read it when I was in college and there was a ton of stuff about cannabis and just this guy's crazy life but there was also a couple of chapters in there about hemp and they talked about a documentary called Hemp's Just Plant the Seed where Woody Harrelson came to Kentucky in the 90s and planted the seeds and it just kind of sparked my interest I had to, I had my grandfather's farm that I was you know that, that no one I knew nobody else was interested in so there was always a possibility uh, but I also knew it was, it was small. It's smaller. It's more of a hobby farm for him. He was a, a businessman, and that was just huge. He didn't like having neighbors, to be honest. But um, you know, the farm was always an in- interesting to me, and so I started reading about hemp and learning once that documentary. And I thought, well, this is silly. If every other country is growing hemp and they're making all this stuff out of it, this is this is where things are going to start to go. And this is in the mid two thousands. I reached out to all these guys, and they said, yeah, we agree, but there's nothing you can really do. Uh, you, know, you can't. Just grow hemp in Kentucky and keep it in Kentucky and make products here for only Kentuckians. And so I graduated college and moved away and never really thought about it again. And kind of got to a, a point in my late twenties where I was wondering, you know, what's the next step? Law school, business school. What do I want to do for? What's something that I can stomach doing for the rest of my life? I think was really how I was thinking of it. And hemp kind of came out of nowhere. And so uh, in the news and in Kentucky, especially. And so. I was looking to make a change and uh, saw it as a little bit of a sign and just kind of felt drawn to it. You know, I, I thought, if, if nothing else, I'll have fun trying to do something great for Kentucky, trying to do something great for, for him in general. And just, you know, packed up my bags. I told my boss the day after the farm bill, I was moving, uh, you know, putting in my notice. And he said, what are you going to do? So I'm going to move home and I'm going to get involved in the hemp industry. And, uh, you know, here we are four, four years and two months later. And, you know, Getting to, getting to give talks in front of 700 people and go and lobby Mitch McConnell to change the laws and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm pretty involved. So, yeah. so <laughs> it, it kind of worked out. How did you come across Mitch McConnell? How did, did you get his, how did you get his attention to move this legislation forward? Uh, well, you know, his original attention was certainly garnered by Jamie Comer, uh, Congressman James Comer from Kentucky, who was our ag commissioner back in 2014 when all this stuff kind of went down. Uh, he and Jonathan Miller, who's a, a lobbyist for the USF Roundtable, really got his staff to read about hemp and understand that this not only was this not marijuana, this was good for farmers and good for uh, the economy. And so I think he realized, like, hey, this is a no-brainer. Um, it's not marijuana, and it's a stance on something that that separates marijuana from hemp. This a lot of good can come from this. And so I think his legacy. And being from Kentucky and understanding how important this was to us here in Kentucky, uh, really, like you said, got his attention and got him to, to kind of back this and, and understand how important this was. Because this is that you know he he released two weeks ago. He said he was going to you know, he kind of announced to the world that he was going to do this, and he's never gotten so much positive feedback ever in 33 <laughs> years in Congress. 
And he was like, you know, that just doesn't happen. Obviously, this is a common sense thing. No, there's not one negative person. Everybody's like, yes, this is great. Thank you. you know, they, they get calls and they track who calls about different issues. And they got a bunch of brand new people that have never called Sarah McConnell's office that said, thank you. This is amazing. And then they got people that called every day for the past three years to complain about something saying, finally, thank you for doing something good. Uh, so you know, he was pretty shy by that. I think he's starting to see how important this can be. Just just the opportunity. You know, give, give the farmers the opportunity, give the businesses the opportunity and see if this will work. And if it does work, it'll be part of his very long legacy uh, as a politician. Yeah. So do you think if they remove hemp in general off the Schedule 1 agenda for the federal government, that that may open the doors up for the other hemp and marijuana plants in the diaspora of America? No, I, I think they're two totally separate issues. So, you know, we're in D.C. We're talking, you know, the main thing is this isn't the camel's nose under the tent. So, you know, the, the people didn't understand hemp is legit farming. It's agriculture. When you're driving through Indiana and you see a cornfield, imagine that being a hemp field that's being harvested by a combine or maybe a tobacco field that's being harvested by hand. But on a massive, massive, massive scale, you don't. There's enough Colorado in, 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 in Colorado right now to cover plenty of states. There's, you don't need that kind of scaled production of marijuana. So when you think think of hemp, think of farmer. When you think of marijuana, think of a warehouse full of plants, and that's a mess, you know a region of a state, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just it's two totally separate categories with two totally separate consumer bases. Uh, so, no, I, you know, I think they're very, very separate. I mean, Mitch McConnell would never vote for a bill for marijuana. <laughs> and he's the sponsor and the champion of a hemp bill. So that, gotcha. that, that, is, that right there should kind of show you how different these two should be viewed. Hey, let me ask you this one last question before we go, because you've pretty much answered all my questions. So we, no, know, that, we know that the plants are very much related to each other. One has a, a very heavy psychoactive property and one does not, which is the one mm-hmm. that we're trying, trying to make legal for Kentucky. But the non psychoactive part of the plant. So like the stalk of a marijuana plant, it, how closely related and for texture and chemistry is that to the basic hemp plant? Well, so the, you know, a marijuana plant's goal is to produce as much floral material as possible. So ah. that's the only part that you're really going to use. Okay. So, you know, those are going to be shorter, fatter, bushier trees. Imagine a Christmas tree. And there's hemp plants that would look like this too, right? They just wouldn't have the THC in those flowers. But at that point, the stalk of the plant really becomes useless unless you put it through a wood chipper because it's a big, round, you know, two-inch in diameter stalk. The hemp stalks that you would use for the fiber that you're talking about need to be tall and skinny. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to process them on any kind of massive scale. Ah. So it's a little bit different. And you have the tall, skinny hemp plant that looks like a cornfield, and then you have the short, not short, but shorter, uh, fatter, wider hemp plants that would look more like a tobacco field. Um, and and those, the, that same tobacco-looking field would look like marijuana, but marijuana's going to be endorsed. I mean, people need to get that, get, get, their, get that through their head. Marijuana is being consumed up to a high level. It's going to have to be grown in, essentially in science labs, right? Um, because you're going to want to know what you're ingesting because you're smoking it. Yep. Whereas when you're ingesting agricultural type things, you're taking them, you know, internally or topically even. Uh, that's not going to, you know, that's it, it, there's going to be hemp in everything one day. Marijuana is still going to be sold at dispensaries or liquor stores or whatever that wherever yeah. route that goes. And the reason I ask the question is because many people don't know when they hear hemp, oh, yeah, you're right. they, they literally. If they hear the word hemp, they think marijuana, and you have to make the distinction between the two, not only in their properties, but in their physical properties as well, so people can have an understanding how these two things differ, even though they're in the same genus or category as far as biology or um, – I can't think of the name of the word. <laughs> but, well, I mean, you know, just think about genes. Like, we all, you know, we all have different genetics, right? Yep. So imagine imagine a dog, right? You've got a pit bull and you've got a chihuahua. <laughs> I mean, they're still both dogs, <laughs> yep. right? Uh, or, or a lemon and an orange. They're both, those are the citrus family, 
but they they could not be any more different in terms of the, you know how they taste, what they what their properties are, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, those are very good examples, and I'm glad that you you, you know that you're pointing out the difference because that is the key. Is hemp is agriculture, uh, marijuana is awesome. Don't get me wrong, but it's not <laughs> ag uh, to that kind of degree and to that you know. Uh, on that scale. Yeah, you know, I understand totally because I actually question it myself. Uh, we had a party two weeks ago and I drank all, like half a fifth of, of Jameson's and felt horrible the next day where I have a buddy of mine who was at the party and he doesn't drink at all. He went and played basketball and he imbibed in his favorite re- recreational activity. <laughs> I was like, hmm, I was like, you know, I'm talking to somebody about hemp and, and some other stuff. And, I, you know, I'm reaching out so I can get the most complete story that I can about this plant and its sub properties so that people are informed because yeah. one of the things I I've grown up with people throughout my life who have been consumers of marijuana and I've grown up with people who were drinkers and I'm going to say by far and large I've come across more assholes who are drinkers than the ones who are smoking marijuana so you know it's in well the- you know that goes back to marijuana marijuana was given to us and cannabis in general was given to us by mother nature or however you want to look at it. Uh, if, 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 whoever your creator is or you know whatever it, that one was good. Alcohol was created by us. <laughs> and if we've learned anything, uh, you know, alcohol, anything that we drink probably has a lot more, you know, unnatural effects than if we if we consume natural things from there. So, yeah, I, I, could, I tend to agree with you. And, side note, uh, you know, I hear hemp extracts help with hangovers as well. <laughs> Hey, Josh, my man, I want to thank you so much for imparting all this information. And so tell everybody how they can reach you, whether you have a Facebook page. Uh, you said your web page, but let's say it again, your Twitter or whatever you have. And even if you have an Instagram, how can people contact you? Yeah, yeah. so uh, the company, the, the product, the company is CB Sciences at cbsciences.com. Uh, our product line is plus. CBD oil, P L U S C B D O I L dot com. And then I actually have a radio show called The Hemp Happy Hour, which has hemphappyhour.com, it has SoundCloud, iTunes. Uh, and then I am at Hendrix Hemp, H E N D R I X, H E M P, on Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, thank you. It was a blast, man. Enjoy your three week. No problem. Ladies and gentlemen, remember this. You have to love yourself first. God created you in his, and I don't mean from the masculine, I mean from the overall, because there's masculine and feminine, in his image. So that means you're part of the universe. So you have to start loving yourself. You can't love anybody else unless you love yourself first. So when you get out the shower or when you get up in the morning, look in the mirror and just take some time before you put your clothes on. Appreciate all the beauty that you were blessed to be with. You may not think it is, but somebody loves you, so you might as well love yourself. Look in your eyes and understand that there's a galaxy there, and that's a universe. When you see somebody else with a galaxy in their eyes, eyeballs, respect them as you would like to be respected, as the doctrine says. Not only that, it's just good to do. Until next time, be loved, be enjoy, and be peaceful. I'm out. Deuces. Peace. Peace.